Okay, well, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to give this mini course and uh, and thank them and also the serum for all the work they're doing to keep this event going online despite the circumstances. I was asked to give uh, an introduction to holomorphic Poisson structures. This is a subject which has its origins in um, classical mechanics. So well, let's consider a particle in one dimension, which has position Q and momentum P, which is mass times the velocity Q dot. And then any other physical quantity we might be interested in would be a function of Q and P. So for instance, the total energy would be uh, the sum of a kinetic term, P squared over 2M, and a potential energy term, V of Q. Now, if you want to know how the system evolves in time, uh, you can solve the equations of motion that were given by Newton, for instance, but I've written them here in a slightly different form, which is the Hamilton form. So the Hamilton form is two separate equations. The first one tells us that uh, the relationship between the velocity and the momentum is Q dot is equal to P over M. Well, that just happens to be the derivative of H with respect to P. Now, on the other hand, uh, the time derivative of the momentum, that's the acceleration times the mass. So by Newton's law, that's the force. And the force is minus the gradient of the potential. So that's minus the derivative of H with respect to Q. So these two equations tell us how Q and P evolve in time. That determines the evolution of the system. And then if we want to know how any other physical quantity is evolving in time, say some function F of Q and P, well, we can use the chain rule. So it says that F dot is the derivative of F with respect to Q times Q dot, plus the derivative of F with respect to P times P dot. Now, if I use Hamilton's equations of motion, I can rewrite Q dot and P dot in terms of H. And I get this expression here, df dq dh dp minus df dp dh dq. So it's kind of skew symmetric combination of the derivatives of F and H. And this particular expression occurs so often that it's given its own symbol, curly brackets. It's called the Poisson bracket of F and H, which I've given here a kind of shorthand notation. So this uh, Poisson bracket is an operation which eats two functions and it differentiates them with respect to Q and P in a kind of skew symmetric fashion, hence the wedge product. The one nice thing about using the Poisson bracket is that it gives us a one-line proof that energy is conserved as the system evolves. So if I want to look at the time derivative of the energy, well, from this calculation, that's the same thing as a bracket of H with itself, but the bracket is skew-symmetric, so that's zero. So that was the very first example of a Poisson bracket that was ever found, and these days, uh, we have a general notion that a phase space of a system should be modeled by a manifold equipped with a Poisson bracket on its functions. So a Poisson structure on a space X is a bracket, curly bracket, which is a bilinear operation. It eats two functions and it gives a third and it satisfies uh, a collection of axioms. So um, the first one, as we saw, is that it's a skew symmetric operation. The next thing is that it's a kind of derivative operator, so it acts like a derivation in either argument. So if I take a bracket of F with G times H, that expands out in the following way, just like the Leibniz rule for derivatives. And the third axiom is a bit less obvious. It's the Jacobi identity. It says that if I take the bracket of three functions in the following way and I cyclically permute, then the sum is equal to zero. So if you've seen the notion of a Lie algebra, uh, the Poisson bracket is a skew symmetric operation that satisfies the Jacobi identity. So it's an example of a Lie algebra, but it also has this additional property that the bracket is a derivation with respect to the multiplication of functions. So whenever we have a Poisson structure on the space X, we can generate a flow using a function just like we did in classical mechanics. So if I take a function H on the space X, then I can look at the operation of taking the bracket with H. Now, by the second axiom, that is a derivation of functions. And we know that derivations of functions are the same as vector fields. 
So I can think of this operation as defining me a vector field on X. Now, this vector field has a name, it's called the Hamiltonian vector field because in the very simple example on the previous slide, it will give us Hamilton's equations of motion when we consider the flow. Okay, and once again, we have the conservation law that if we look at the value of H along its, the flow of its Hamiltonian vector field, that's going to be constant because of the skew symmetry of the bracket. So the Poisson bracket gives a very uh, useful way of uh, looking for conservation law for these kind of systems. So Poisson geometry is uh, quite simply is the study of manifolds uh, equipped with Poisson brackets or maybe more singular spaces like varieties. Um, of course, it has the origins in classical mechanics as we saw, and then um, also the work of Lie on Lie algebras and Lie groups, and really became a subject in its own right starting in the 1970s and 1980s with the work of Lichtenrovich and, uh, and Weinstein. Um, and nowadays it's connected to lots of different parts of mathematics. So in this mini course, I'm going to be focusing mostly on the connections with the uh, foliation theory and algebraic geometry. So the plan for the mini course is as follows. Um, it's going to be four lectures. I'm going to try to give a rough introduction to uh, analytic and algebraic Poisson varieties over the complex numbers. So the first lecture will just be some very basic uh, constructions in, in Poisson geometry. And in the second lecture, I'll explain why there are some foliations kicking around. And then in the third and fourth lectures, I'm going to speak a little bit about the global structure of these varieties. Um, so in terms of prerequisites, if you have some basic knowledge of complex manifolds and a little bit about foliations, I hope that you'll be able to follow along. Um, if you have also a little bit of knowledge of Lie algebras and Lie groups uh, or symplectic geometry, that will help you to appreciate some of the structure and, and examples. Okay, so I'm going to give plenty of examples of these uh, Poisson structures in this lecture. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to set a few uh, conventions about notations and, uh, and tensors. So essentially throughout the entire course, X will be a, a complex analytic or algebraic variety. You can interpret that as you like. Uh, most of the time for simplicity, I'm going to assume that X is smooth. So it's a complex manifold, but actually this assumption can be dropped in many places and can allow more singular things. Um, and I'm going to use some standard notations for various sheaves. So for instance, OX will be the sheaf of holomorphic or regular algebraic functions on X. TX, as we already saw, denotes the vector fields on X. So those are derivations of functions. Omega will be the differential forms and so on. Uh, another collection of tensors, which is maybe slightly less familiar in a basic differential geometry course, are the so-called polyvectors. So they're defined in the following way. So again, the vector fields we think of as derivations of functions. Well, if we consider now the pth exterior power of the vector fields, these are what are called the, the p-vector fields or polyvector fields. And uh, we can think of these as uh, what are called skew multi-derivations. So I have uh, P vectors wedged together. It means that I can take P functions and I can operate on them in a totally skew symmetric fashion and get another function, which, uh, and this is a derivation with respect to each entry. So in this way, I can think of uh, a multi-derivation on functions as a section of this wedge P of the tangent bundle. Now here's one point where you have to be slightly careful if X is singular, you have to replace uh, the polyvectors everywhere with a slightly different uh, sheaf, but I'm gonna be mostly assuming, as I said, that X is smooth. So I'm gonna stick to this notation of wedge P of T. So one interesting structure that is present with these polyvector fields uh, is an extension of the Lie bracket of vector fields. So remember that the Lie bracket of two vector fields is another vector field, which you get by taking the commutator of the corresponding derivations. 
Well, it turns out it's possible to extend this operation to all polyvector fields. And what you get is an operation of degree minus one. So it takes something of degree P and something of degree Q and returns something of degree P plus Q minus one. And of particular importance in, in Poisson geometry is the case where P and Q are equal to two. So then you take two bivector fields and the output is a tri-vector field. We're gonna make use of this on the next slide. So what I want to do is, is re-encode this notion of a Poisson bracket in a tensorial fashion using a, the notion of a bivector. So remember the Poisson bracket had three axioms. The first two axioms were that it's skew symmetric and that it's a derivation in the arguments. Well, in light of what we said on the previous slide, that's equivalent to saying that there's a bivector field pi, which lives in wedge two of the tangent bundle, such that this bracket is given by uh, this by vector field in the following way. So if I wanna know the bracket of two functions f and g, then I can pair the derivative df wedge dg with this by vector pi. Now, quite concretely in local coordinates, say xi on the space x, um, any bivector field will be written in the form pi is the sum of some functions pi ij times the uh, coordinate derivatives dxi and dxj. And what this expression means is that um, the Poisson bracket of two functions f and g is given by this expression here. So I take the skew symmetric combination of their derivatives, which is indicated by this wedge product. So df dxi dg dxj minus the opposite. And then I multiply by this uh, coefficient function pi ij. So in light of this expression, you can read off exactly what pi ij is in terms of the brackets. It's just the brackets of the elementary coordinate. And then there was a third axiom for the Poisson bracket. So far, we've only used the first two. The third one was the Jacobi identity. And remember that that says that a particular expression is equal to zero. So this expression is what I get when I take three functions and I take their bracket in this way and I cyclically permute. That expression is called the Jacobiator of f, g, and h. And the Jacobi identity says that the Jacobiator is equal to zero always. Now it turns out that this Jacobiator can be expressed in terms of the bivector in, in the following way. So whenever I have a bracket which is skew symmetric and a derivation, um, this Jacobiator will also be totally skew symmetric and a derivation in every argument. So it's represented by some trivector and that trivector is exactly given by taking the bracket of pi with itself. So this pi bracket pi again is a trivector um, and so what you see is that the Jacobi identity for the Poisson bracket is equivalent to the statement that the bracket of pi with itself is equal to zero, okay? So again, in local coordinates, um, I can write this funny expression pi brackets pi, um, in the following way. So now it's a trivector. So the basis trivectors are given by these expressions dxi, dxj, dxk. And the coefficient of that trivector is exactly um, this expression, the Jacobiator applied to the functions xi, xj, and xk. So what this tells you, for instance, is that if you define the brackets uh, pi ij in local coordinates, then it's enough to check that the Jacobi identity holds for the coordinate functions, and then this whole expression will be equal to zero. And then that will mean that the Jacobi identity actually holds for all functions. Okay, so um, the upshot of the previous slide is that a Poisson bracket on the space X uh, can be equivalently encoded in the data of a tensor pi, which is a section of wedge two of the tangent bundle, and uh, the bracket of pi with itself, this Skousen bracket, is equal to zero.
as a tri vector. And now you may ask, for instance, how do I think about the Hamiltonian vector field of a function in terms of this bivector pi? Well, in order to do that, it's useful to introduce a map called the anchor map. So anchor map, which you can con construct for any bivector, it's a map from forms to vector fields, which is just given by the interior contraction. So if I have a one form alpha, then I can contract it into the bivector field pi, and what I'll get left over is a vector field. And now if I want to describe the Hamiltonian vector field, I can write it in the following way. So I have a function f, I consider its Hamiltonian vector field cf, Um, and that's, again, the operation of bracketing with f, uh, thought of as a derivation. Well, that operation by the correspondence between the Poisson bracket and the bivector is given by pairing the bivector with df wedge whatever's in the remaining slot. But that's exactly the definition of the contraction of the one form df into pi. So in other words, uh, this is this anchor map pi sharp applied to the one form df. So the Hamiltonian vector field of a function is given by applying this bundle map pi sharp to the derivative df. Okay, so let's have some examples of Poisson brackets. So the very simplest Poisson brackets are the constant ones, by which I mean the following. Let me take x to be cn, and uh, I'll define a Poisson bracket, which is uh, given by an expression like this. So the bracket of the coordinates xi and xj is just some constant lambda ij. So in other words, the corresponding bivector is given by uh, the sum lambda ij dxi, which dxj. And so I claim that the Jacobi identity holds for this bracket, and as I said, it's enough to check that the Jacobi identity holds for the coordinate function. So what I need to do is consider a triple bracket of the following form. Well, uh, from the definition, that's the same as the bracket of xi with the constant function lambda jk. But since lambda jk is a constant and the bracket involves taking derivatives, this whole expression is equal to zero. So actually, whenever I have a triple bracket of the coordinate functions, it's equal to zero, which means that when I cyclically permute them and sum them up, I still get zero. And so the Jacobi identity must hold. Um, I could phrase this more invariantly. So suppose that I consider x a finite dimensional vector space v. Uh, and I take an element in wedge two of this vector space, then I could think of that as defining a bivector field, which is constant in the natural trivialization of the tangent bundle. Uh, and when I do that, uh, what I'll get is a bivector field whose scout and bracket with itself is equal to zero, so it defines a Poisson structure. Now, uh, if you think back to basic skew symmetric linear algebra, what you learn is that any uh, skew symmetric tensor always has even rank, say uh, rank of pi is equal to 2r. And moreover, you can choose a nice basis in which, in which this, uh, this tensor has a standard form. So there exist uh, coordinates q and p. They come in pairs, qi, pi one pair for every number between one and r. Uh, and then there's some additional coordinates, zj, which uh, fill up the rest of this space v. And the nice thing about these coordinates is that pi is written in a standard form. It's just the sum d dqi wedge d dpi. In particular, the zs don't appear anywhere. Um, so what this means, for instance, is that the bracket of qi with pj is always equal to zero unless the indices are the same, in which case it's equal to one, so that's this Kronecker delta ij. 
Uh, on the other hand, there are no terms involving del Q wedge del Q, so that means that the bracket of any Qs is equal to zero. And similarly, the, the bracket of any Ps is equal to zero. And finally, Z is completely absent from this entire expression. So if I ever bracket uh, function Z with anything whatsoever, I'll get zero. Okay, so this is uh, kind of the standard uh, canonical form for a uh, constant Poisson bracket on C. A slightly more complicated, we can consider the case where the Poisson bracket of the coordinate functions is a linear combination of coordinate functions. So it's again a linear function where these c, i, j, k's are constants. And what this means, for instance, is that if I look at the span of these coordinates, well, that will give me an n dimensional subspace in the space of all functions. That's the space of homogeneous linear functions on x. And uh, this uh, expression says that that, operate, uh, that subspace is closed under the bracket, so it forms a, a Lie algebra of dimension n. Um, so what this gives us is a correspondence, one-to-one -one correspondence between finite dimensional Lie algebras and finite dimensional vector spaces, who's uh, equipped with a Poisson bracket that's linear in coordinates like this. So under this correspondence, a Lie algebra G corresponds to a Poisson manifold, which is the dual vector space, G check. So for instance, we could consider the example of the Lie algebra SL2C of traceless two by two matrices. So that's a three dimensional vector space. It has a basis given by the matrices E, F, and H. And uh, this uh, vector space is a Lie algebra where the, the bracket operation is the commutator of matrices. So you can calculate the standard relations between these matrices. The, bracket, the commutator of E and F is equal to H and so on. So this is a finite dimensional Lie algebra and it's supposed to correspond now to a Poisson manifold. Um, and the way that you figure out the Poisson bracket is that you think of this basis, E, F, and H, as being linear coordinates on the dual vector space, which is, again, a copy of C3. And then uh, these commutator relations, they tell you the Poisson, berlac, excuse me, the Poisson bracket relations between these coordinate functions. So in other words, the corresponding bivector is given by this expression. So for instance, looking at the first term, this would say that the bracket of E and F is equal to H. The second term says that the bracket of H and E is equal to 2E, corresponding to this expression. And this one says that the bracket of H and F is minus 2F, reflected. Okay, another example, which is hopefully familiar to several people, is the notion of a symplectic manifold. So this comes from looking at bivectors which are non-degenerate. So we'll say that a bivector field on X is non-degenerate if it defines a non-degenerate bilinear form on each cotangent space of X. So a bivector could be thought of as a pairing on the cotangent spaces. Uh, so this non-degeneracy condition can be rephrased in many different ways. So Again, from skew-symmetric linear algebra, we know right away that the dimension of X has to be even and that the top exterior power of the bivector must be non-vanishing. That's equivalent to non-degeneracy. This is kind of like saying that the determinant is non-zero. Um, another way of saying it is that this anchor map, which remember for any bivector, takes a one form and gives a uh, vector field, this anchor map must be an isomorphism. Uh, and so if that map is an isomorphism, then we can invert it, and the inverse corresponds to a two form on X. And that two form will also have to uh, be invertible, so it's non-degenerate. So a non-degenerate bivector can equivalently be encoded by a non-degenerate two form. And then there's the question of this integrability condition corresponding to the Jacobi identity. 
Well, what you can check is that the condition that pi brackets pi is equal to zero is equivalent to saying that the inverse two form is closed, d omega is equal to zero. So this gives an equivalence between uh, non-degenerate Poisson structures and these uh, what are called symplectic forms. So a symplectic form is a two form which is closed and non-degenerate. And in our setting, everything is holomorphic. So this two form is holomorphic. Uh, there's an important theorem in, in symplectic geometry, which tells you that any symplectic two form can be written in a standard way in local coordinates. Um, what it says is that uh, you can always find coordinates in which the bivector is constant. So it's given by this sum d by dqi wedge d by dpi, like we saw a couple of slides ago. That's called Darboux's theorem, and uh, I'll talk about a, a more general form of this theorem for more general Poisson manifolds later in the talk. Okay, so another example to consider would be uh, the case of uh, surfaces. So let's now consider the case where X is a smooth complex surface. So a smooth complex manifold of dimension two. Well, in that case, wedge two of the tangent bundle, that's actually the highest possible exterior power of the tangent bundle, it's the determinant, which goes by the name KX inverse, the anti-canonical line bundle. So our, our Poisson structure is necessarily a section of this line bundle, K inverse. Uh, so in local coordinates, what this says is that uh, pi can be written as some function of the coordinates x1 and x2 times the coordinate uh, bivector dx1, dx2. And again, because of the dimension, wedge three has to be equal to zero. So that tells us that no matter which section we take, it will automatically satisfy pi brackets pi equals zero. So on a surface, any bivector will define a Poisson bracket. Um, one thing that's useful to look at is uh, the zero locus of pi. Uh, which will be an anti-canonical divisor. So it just simply means it's a zero set of a section of this particular line bundle. And uh, this will be a curve if it's not empty, simply because it's given by the vanishing of a single function, which in local coordinates is this f. So for instance, you could consider the case where x is the projective plane P2. Well, this line bundle K inverse is a line bundle of degree three, and the upshot is that the vanishing locus of pi will always be a cubic curve. So cubic curves are very classical things. We know what they look like. Here's a picture of all the different possibilities. Now, the most generic situation, uh, you choose pi generically, then this curve y will be smooth, in which case it will be an elliptic curve. Or you could have a singular curve, for instance, with one uh, nodal point or a cusp, or you could have a curve which has many irreducible components or even the possibility of some components which occur with higher multiplicity if the situation is very degenerate. If we consider the structure of this Poisson bracket, um, it will be non-degenerate on the complement of Y, so then this uh, structure will be symplectic and the Darboux theorem applies to tell us that pi is locally the pro uh, given by dq wedge dp. On the other hand, if I were to look near a smooth point of this curve y, I'd be able to find coordinates u and v where it takes on the following form. So it vanishes linearly. It looks like the Poisson bracket corresponding to the dual of a two-dimensional non-abelian Lie algebra. So you see that the local structure in general can, can vary from point to point in a manifold. We should talk a little bit also about the natural notion of morphisms between Poisson manifolds. So suppose that I have two Poisson manifolds, Y and X, and I have a map between them. What does it mean to be a Poisson map? Well, the natural thing to consider would be for phi to be compatible with the Poisson brackets on X and Y. 
So more precisely, if I take the bracket of two functions f and g on x and then pull it back by phi, that's equivalent to first pulling back the functions by phi and then taking their bracket on y. So you'd want phi, in other words, to be a homomorphism with respect to the brackets. Now this can also be rephrased in terms of the bivector. So the bivector on y, you could push it forward to a, get a bivector on x, and it would have to match the bivector on x. So for instance, let's consider the case where uh, this target space x is one dimensional, so it's a curve. Well, then wedge two of its tangent bundle is identically equal to zero. So the only possible Poisson bracket on X is the zero Poisson bracket. Um, on the other hand, we could consider any Poisson bracket on Y. And in light of this uh, formulation in terms of the bivector, it's clear that any map of this form will be a Poisson map. On the other hand, uh, we could consider an open set U inside some Poisson manifold X. And then simply by restricting the Poisson bracket, I'll be able to define a Poisson bracket on this open set U. And the map, which is the inclusion of U into X will be a Poisson map. I could also consider the case of a closed subvariety in X. We could ask when is this inclusion of this closed subvariety of Poisson map? Well, that's equivalent to saying that the Poisson bracket on X descends to a Poisson bracket on the functions on Y, which is the quotient of OX by the ideal IY consisting of all the functions that vanish on Y. Well, for the bracket to descend along this quotient, that's Again, equivalent to saying that uh, I is an ideal for the Poisson bracket. So if I take the bracket of anything in the ideal with anything else, I land back in the ideal. And with a little bit of work, you can convince yourself that in terms of the bivector, this is equivalent to saying that the bivector pi is tangent to this subspace Y. So for instance, this tells us that in the non-degenerate situation of a symplectic manifold, there are very few closed Poisson subvarieties. Um, if the bivector is going to be tangent to a subvariety, it actually uh, has to be the entire subvariety. The reason is that um, you know, this uh, anchor map is surjective onto the tangent bundle, so um, any subspace which sits inside the tangent space and also inside the image of pi, it must be the whole tangent space of y. Excuse me, whole tangent space of x. So in general, this condition for a subvariety to be Poisson is a very restrictive condition. Um, another example, you could consider two Poisson manifolds, x and y, and you could consider their product, x times y, well, you can give that a bivector by putting x on, pi x on the first factor and pi y on the second factor, and that will define a Poisson structure. In fact, it's the unique Poisson structure such that the projections to x and y are Poisson maps. If you have a group acting on a Poisson manifold by Poisson isomorphism, so every group element gives a diffeomorphism of X, which is also a Poisson map. And suppose that the quotient is a reasonably nice variety, then uh, there will exist a unique Poisson structure on the quotient that makes the quotient map a Poisson map. 
Okay, so now with this notion of uh, Poisson maps and, and products of Poisson structures, I'm going to state one of the first foundational theorems in Poisson geometry, which is Weinstein splitting theorem. It tells us about the local structure of a Poisson manifold near a point. The statement is the following. We have a Poisson manifold X uh, with a Poisson bracket given by a bivector field pi. And let's consider a point little x where this uh, tensor uh, as a bilinear form has rank 2r. Remember, it's always even. Then his theorem says that there exists coordinates. They come in groups of pairs, q and p, and some additional coordinates, z, which are these coordinates form a complete coordinate system centered at x. And the bivector field can be written as a sum of two terms now. So there's the first term, which corresponds to what we would expect for a constant Poisson bracket of rank 2r. It's in green here, involving the q's and p's. But the Poisson bracket may not be constant in coordinates, as we've seen. And so there are additional terms which involve these uh, coordinates z. But you see, if uh, the rank is equal to uh, 2r, then these additional terms involving z, they must all vanish at this point x. Otherwise, we would have a tensor which had rank bigger than 2r at x. So these functions g, they vanish at x. And the key thing about this theorem is not just that we can write the Poisson tensor in this way, that's essentially just a bit of linear algebra. The key point is that um, these remaining functions, the brackets, which indicate the bracket as of z, j, and z, k, these are functions only of z. So this uh, expression in red, which I've denoted pi tilde, is called the transverse Poisson structure, and Weinstein even proves that it's unique up to isomorphism. So the upshot of this theorem is that in a neighborhood of any point, the Poisson manifold is isomorphic to the product of a symplectic manifold, which is given by this green expression, and a Poisson structure which vanishes at a point, which is given by this transverse Poisson structure. So as a very special case of this result, we get back a uh, theorem which I alluded to earlier, the Darboux theorem. What it says is that if this bivector field has constant rank near this point x, well, if that's going to be the case, then actually this uh, transverse Poisson structure had vanish, better vanish in, identically in a neighborhood of x. So then we can write pi locally as a sum of the dqi's which dpi's. So in other words, um, it's constant in, in local coordinates. So maybe I'll just take a minute to sketch the proof of this theorem. So we need to show that if the rank of pi at a point is equal to 2r, and I can split it up in this way. So the argument is an induction on the rank. Uh, the first step is that if the rank is equal to 0, there's nothing to prove, simply because I can take all of the coordinates to be these z's. And then I have something which vanishes at a point, and uh, there's nothing more to say. So we may as well assume that the rank is at least 2. Well, if that's the case, then it means that I can definitely find two functions, say q and p tilde, whose Poisson bracket, when evaluated at the point x, is not equal to 0. And then by definition of the Hamiltonian vector field of q, the Hamiltonian vector field is not 0 at that point. Now there's a useful theorem about vector fields called the straightening out theorem which uh, tells you then that you can find a function which acts like the time parameter along the flow of this vector field. So in other words, there exists a function called p such that when I differentiate p along this vector field, I get 1. But then that means that the Poisson bracket of q and p is equal to 1. So now it looks like we've got this first term in our Poisson structure. And now we need to extend it to get more coordinates. And the trick here is that you can use the Jacobi identity to check that the two vector fields, the Hamiltonian of Q and the Hamiltonian of P, they're commuting vector fields. 
Um, and for that, you use this nice identity, which says that the Lie bracket of two Hamiltonian vector fields is the Hamiltonian of the Poisson bracket. And that lets us then extend the coordinates using these commuting vector fields to find some uh, coordinates Z, such that the Hamiltonian of Q is del P and the Hamiltonian of P is del Q. So now we've got a situation where the Poisson bracket of Q and P is equal to one, as we already observed. But then if the Hamiltonian of Q is equal to del P, it means that also the bracket of Q with any Z is equal to zero. And similarly, the bracket of P with any Z is equal to zero. So that means that there are no cross terms in this bivector, which involve, a, say, a del Q wedge of del Z. So now it looks like we've got a splitting in this form. The only issue is that these component functions g, j, k, we haven't yet shown that they only depend on z. So we need to prove that. And now we're going to use the Jacobi identity one more time. So for instance, we want to show that zi bracket zj is independent of p. We take the derivative with respect to p. Well, that's the same as the Hamiltonian vector field q applied to that bracket which by definition of the Hamiltonian vector field is a bracket of Q with bracket ZI, ZJ. And now I can use the Jacobi identity to turn this into um, a bracket involving Q and ZI and a bracket involving Q and ZJ. But we already concluded that if I bracket Z with anything I, involving a Q, I get zero. So this whole expression is equal to zero. So that tells us that zi, zj is independent of p, and similarly we get zi, zj is independent of q. And in the end, we conclude that we've written pi as a bivector of the form del q wedge del p plus something depending only on z. And then the rank of that remaining thing must be uh, the rank of pi minus 2. So now we can continue by induction on rank, keep splitting off q's and p's until we get to the desired form. Okay, so that concludes the first lecture, and uh, in the next lecture, we'll explain um, how some foliations arise on these possible.